In Death Valley National Park, perhaps the most unforgiving environment on planet Earth, there lives a fish that shouldn't exist. The Devil's Hole Pupfish. This place breaks every rule about where fish are supposed to live. We're in Death Valley, literally the hottest, driest place in North America. Yet somehow, impossibly, there are fish up there. Not just surviving, but thriving in an environment that would kill almost anything else. It survives in the smallest habitat of any vertebrae species on Earth, a limestone crack barely larger than a hotel room filled with 91 degree water that would kill most other fish. Today, there are only 57 of them left in the wild. These thumb-sized fish have been living in complete isolation for tens of thousands of years in conditions so extreme that scientists didn't even believe it was possible for them to be a separate species until nearly 40 years after their discovery. But in 1967, their impossible existence collided with the American dream when a ranching family spent $7 million to buy 12,000 acres of empty Nevada desert. They had big plans, drill wells, pump groundwater, and turn wasteland into profitable farmland. It was exactly how the West had been developed for over a century. But when those ranch pumps started running, the devil's whole water level began dropping for the first time in recorded history. And what happened next would reach the Supreme Court in a legal battle that would decide whether one of the world's rarest species would survive or disappear forever. All of this because of a few dozen fish living in one of the most unforgiving places on Earth. Devil's Hole isn't just small, it's utterly bizarre. The water-filled cavern extends so deep that we've never actually measured the bottom. It shakes violently whenever there's a major earthquake anywhere on the planet. The water stays at exactly 91 degrees year-round, fed by springs that bubble up from the depths. It's seemingly an impossible home for any living thing much less one of the world's rarest creatures. And getting there feels like you're approaching a maximum security prison. After miles of driving through empty desert, you encounter a 10-foot tall chain link fence topped with barbed wire surrounding the entire site. Walking up here, you sort of feel like it's crazy anyone discovered this in the first place. And now the security around it feels insane too. People have threatened to throw arsenic into this hole. People have printed kill the pupfish stickers, all because of the money being spent to save the fish in the hole in the ground. But I'm here with a massive telephoto lens, hoping to glimpse a fish that's almost impossible for the average visitor to see with their naked eye. They're down there on a small spawning shelf where every wild pupfish that's ever lived was born. It's just below the surface, and it's the entire dangerous universe for a species that breaks every rule about where fish are supposed to live. But before I see if I can spot them, I have to go back more than a century to understand just how strange it is that these fish were even found in the first place and why exactly their environment is surrounded by security cameras and barbed wired fencing today. The first humans to see these fish were probably Shoshone hunters who came here for the constant water source but they left no records, no stories about the strange creatures living in the devil's pool. It wasn't until 1891 that science caught up with this place when a federal survey team stumbled across Devil's Hole during the Death Valley expedition. They were cataloging the most extreme life forms in the American Southwest, scorpions that could survive being frozen, plants that could live without water for years, bacteria that thrived in boiling springs. What they found in this limestone crack was perhaps the most extreme of all, fish that had made a home in what amounted to a flooded cave. The expedition's ichthyologist, that's fish scientist, Charles Gilbert, made a crucial mistake. Looking at specimens preserved in alcohol jars, he couldn't see what made these fish special. He classified them as just another population of desert pupfish, missing the fact that these were something entirely unique a species that had been isolated here since before humans invented agriculture. For 40 years, no scientist bothered to look closer. Devil's Hole was just a dot on a government map, noting a deep well of unknown purpose, essentially in the middle of nowhere. Ranchers probably knew about it, miners probably chucked rocks in it, but nobody could figure out a use for the hole in the ground that seemed to serve no purpose. But then, in 1930, Stanford graduate student Joseph Wales descended into Devil's Hole with collection nets, and what he found changed everything. These weren't just desert pupfish, they were their own species entirely. Smaller, more iridescent, completely lacking the pelvic fins of their cousins. 
They had evolved in complete isolation, becoming something found nowhere else in the universe. Whales named them Cyprinodon diabolus, the devil's pupfish, after the hole that had become their entire world. But as whales and other researchers began exploring the broader area around Death Valley, they discovered this was just the beginning. Scattered across the Mojave Desert were dozens of tiny spring-fed oases, each hosting its own pupfish species that had been evolving in isolation for tens of thousands of years. Just 15 miles from Devil's Hole, in the crystal clear springs of what would become Ash Meadows National Wildlife Refuge, they found the Ash Meadows Amargosa pupfish, living in 10 separate springs, each with its own unique temperature and chemical signature. Unlike their Devil's Hole cousins, these fish are relatively easy to see today. Visitors can walk out on boardwalks and peer down into crystal clear spring pools where hundreds of silvery pupfish dart between algae mats and rocky outcrops. Nearby, the Warm Springs pupfish occupy an even more precarious position in just six springs at higher elevation. In the small desert town of Shoshone, California, another species called the Shoshone pupfish had been thriving in thermal springs for millennia. Each population was perfectly adapted to its own tiny ecosystem, some surviving in water so hot it would kill most fish, others enduring brine so salty it was almost like seawater. Wales and his colleagues had uncovered something unprecedented, an entire evolutionary laboratory hidden in the desert where life had found ways to persist in the most unlikely places imaginable. But America's gaze was turning toward the desert, and these fish were about to face off with development and ambition in a battle that would reshape the West. When Francis and Marilyn Capart arrived in the Amargosa Valley in 1967, they were pioneers of a sort the tail end of the last generation that could truly get lost in the West. No pictures of them can be found online today, despite the battle they sparked. But from what we know of them, we know their goal wasn't to threaten evolutionary history. They were entrepreneurs chasing the American dream in one of its purest forms, turning the empty desert they purchased into productive farmland through the miracle of irrigation. By Nevada law, they owned the water rights beneath their land. They had purchased them legally, filed the proper paperwork, and followed every regulation. When they began drilling wells in 1968 to irrigate alfalfa fields and to water their cattle, they were doing exactly what the American West had been built on, making the desert bloom. But the effect on Devil's Hole was immediate and catastrophic. Water levels began dropping for the first time ever. As the Capert's pumps worked day and night through 1972, Devil's Hole dropped two and a half feet. That shallow shelf that had sustained the pupfish for millennia was suddenly exposed to air. Fish that had survived ice ages and volcanic eruptions were being killed by agriculture. But this wasn't just about Devil's Hole. The entire network of desert springs was connected through underground aquifers, and the massive pumping was threatening all of them. The Ash Meadows pupfish populations began fluctuating wildly. Springs that had flowed for thousands of years started drying up an entire evolutionary treasure trove was at risk. James Deacon, a young UNLV biology professor who had been diving in Devil's Hole since 1961, understood that he was watching potential mass extinction in real time. Along with California fish biologist Phil Peaster, Deacon founded the Desert Fishes Council and launched a publicity campaign for a fish most people would never even see. They distributed Save the Pupfish bumper stickers across the Southwest, wrote letters to newspapers, and lobbied anyone who would listen. But the opposition was swift and fierce. Nye County Commissioner Robert Rudd printed Kill the Pupfish stickers in response. A local newspaper editor publicly threatened to dump pesticide into Devil's Hole. The conflict wasn't just about water rights. It was about competing visions about what the American West should be. As one lawyer would later argue in court, there are two endangered species here, the pupfish and the American rancher. This is why Devil's Hole looks like a fortress today. The barbed wire and steel caging aren't just about protecting the fish from accidents, they're about protecting them from people who see them as obstacles to progress. The legal battle that followed reached the Supreme Court and established precedents that still govern water rights across the American West today. The government's case rested on a revolutionary legal theory that when President Truman made Devil's Hole part of Death Valley National Monument in 1952, he had implicitly reserved whatever water was necessary to keep the pupfish alive. 
During oral arguments, the justices grappled with a fundamental question that cuts to the heart of conservation. What makes these fish worth protecting? When Justice Rehnquist pressed the government's lawyer about what these creatures actually contribute to humanity, the response revealed how difficult it can be to defend the intrinsic value of species. What do they do, if anything, for humanity, Mr. Randolph? Randolph, the government's lawyer, tried to explain their research potential, their possible insights into adaptation. These species, these little animals, they may very well hold the key to our future as human beings as they learn to adapt to the changes in their own habitat, just as we're having to do through our own polluted waters and our own smog and so on. Justice Potter Stewart didn't seem to buy it and delivered a line that brought laughter to the courtroom. It's not like a very rosy future. Each of us is one inch long. <laughs> I don't I think we'd be capable of water dying within a year. That moment of levity captured something profound about the case. Here were nine justices trying to weigh the survival of creatures so small and short-lived that they seemed almost absurd against the established rights of American ranchers. Yet, somehow, the fish won. On June 7, 1976, the Supreme Court delivered a unanimous decision that sent shockwaves across the West. When the federal government reserves land for a specific purpose, the court declared it automatically reserves enough water to fulfill that purpose. The Capperts could keep pumping, but they had to stop when Devil's Hole water level dropped below a specific benchmark. It was a complete victory for 40 fish in a hole in the ground and a devastating loss for a family who had invested everything in trying to make the desert productive. The Capperts sold their ranch and left Nevada, abandoning their version of the American dream for a fish that most people will never even see. The legal protection didn't solve the pupfish's problems. Population counts revealed something no one expected, wild fluctuations that defied every rule of population biology. The Devil's Hole pupfish swung from highs around 500 fish in good years to terrifying lows that bottomed out at just 35 individuals in 2013. When geneticists finally sequenced the Devil's Hole pupfish DNA in 2022, they discovered why the fish shouldn't exist. These fish showed the most extreme inbreeding of any wild vertebrate ever studied. The average fish shared 58% of its DNA with every other fish. To put this in perspective, human siblings share 50%. This means that any two randomly chosen pupfish are more closely related than full brothers and sisters. The genetic damage was extensive. The population lost 15 entire genes, including five involved in adapting to low oxygen environments, ironic considering the environment in which the fish live. A gene responsible for sperm production was also damaged, which should cause sterility, but somehow the fish continued to reproduce. Climate change added another layer of threat across all the spring systems. Water temperatures were approaching the fish's physiological limits, and optimal spawning windows were shrinking with each passing year. By the 2000s, legal protection clearly wasn't enough. These fish needed intervention. The solution was as ambitious as it was expensive. Build perfect replicas of their habitats. The Ash Meadows Fish Conservation Facility opened in 2013 at a cost of $4.5 million, housing a 100,000-gallon system that replicates every detail of Devil's Hole. With this safeguard in place, things looked promising. The spring 2024 count brought unprecedented good news for Devil's Hole. 191 fish, a 25-year high. Across the region, all the ash meadows species seemed stable. Huge populations were visible to visitors, hoping to see the rare fish in real life. But Devil's Hole is uniquely precarious and disaster struck. In 2024, a magnitude 7 earthquake in Northern California created violent sloshing in Devil's Hole that swept eggs and larvae from the spawning shelf. A second earthquake in February 2025 repeated the damage. The spring 2025 count revealed only 38 fish remained, an 80% decline in less than a year. Scientists were forced to make an unprecedented decision. On May 15, 2025, they released 19 captive bred pupfish into Devil's Hole to supplement the wild population. The situation was just too urgent. The pupfish were too close to the brink. Standing here now, peering down into that glowing blue water through the security cage, I can barely make out the shelf where 57 fish are carrying on their ancient business. With the naked eye, they're almost impossible to see, 
just occasional flickers of movement in the depths. But through the massive telephoto lens we've rigged up, suddenly their world comes into focus. Through the viewfinder, I can see them clearly for the first time. Small fish, no bigger than my thumb. Their iridescent bodies catching the filtered sunlight as they navigate their entire universe. It's a privilege to get to witness this. The telephoto lens reveals details that most people will never see. The way they move with purpose across their tiny domain. How they've learned to make a life in less space than most people's bathrooms. Every moment is a testament to millions of years of evolution compressed into the smallest possible space. Now I'll admit, as a photographer, it's easy to be disappointed that this footage, shot with a $16,000 lens, is still the best I could manage of the Devil's Hole pupfish. Even the park biologists only go into Devil's Hole twice a year to do their count, with carefully sterilized equipment to ensure the pupfish's safety. But then you remember, these precautions, this distance, exist precisely because of what these fish have been through. The legal battles, the millions of dollars spent on conservation facilities, the countless hours of scientific research. Also, these 57 fish can continue their ancient routines, unaware that they've become symbols of something much larger than themselves. The Devil's Hole pupfish don't need to be useful to be valuable. They don't need to serve human purpose to deserve protection. They deserve to exist because they represent millions of years of evolutionary history. They remind us that life is tenacious and creative and full of surprises. In their simple endurance, they offer us something reassuring in our anxious age. Proof that survival is possible, even in the most unlikely places. If life can persist for tens of thousands of years in holes in the ground in the Nevada desert, maybe there's hope for the rest of us too.